The following program is an independent production, apart from DJ DP Productions. The views, opinions, and ideas of the producers of The Darkest Hour do not necessarily reflect those of the staff of DJ DP Productions, its partners or affiliates. The producers of The Darkest Hour with Amanda Jane of Forget Me Not, assume all responsibility for the content of its program. Should you have questions or concerns regarding The Darkest Hour with Amanda Jane, please contact the producers directly. Or you may also contact the staff at Neo Retro FM through email at djdphoenix at protonmail.com. Be sure to include the date of the program and the subject matter you're inquiring about. And now, Neo Retro FM presents The Darkest Hour with Amanda Jane, streamed live from Marysville, Washington. friends, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Shadows, cast by others, by objects, and even sometimes by the unknown. What's more frightening, really? Seeing things that you can't explain, or hearing things that you can't see. Maybe each house is a terror of their own, different, but the same, and how they always leave you feeling uneasy. Tonight's episode, we will dive into the shadows, through the experiences of others. Let's get started, shall we? We recently moved into my husband's aunt's house. She passed away last year, and the house was left as a gift to my husband. She had no children, lived alone most of her life, and my husband Daniel was like a son to her. One morning, just a few months after moving in, I was cleaning up my son's room when I found a toy that I didn't recognize. It was a very old stuffed bear, missing one of its button eyes, completely void of all fur or other cute markings. I took the bear to my husband, asking if he'd ever seen it before. He recognized it right away. Oh, no way, he said excitedly, grabbing the bear from me and beginning to tell me how this bear belonged to his aunt. It's Barry. Aunt Clee would always let me sleep with it when I stayed here. He smiled. You know, protect me from... Anything bad or the scary. Ah, how cool. Where did you find him? I told my husband, and we went to ask our son where he found the toy. When we did, he told us, Auntie gave it to me, Papa, to keep away the scaries. We exchanged a look, and then I asked, When did Auntie give it to you, honey? And he responds, Last night, Mama. There's more toys, too. If I get scared again, Mama, can you help me get them? Both my husband and I are a bit taken aback, but we keep going, asking our son, where are the toys? He tells us to go to the tall floor, and we think he means the top floor. And so we make our way up the stairs, where he points to the ceiling, where the entrance to the attic is. My husband reaches up and pulls down the attic stairs, I stay down with our son while he looks for the toys. My son telling me, I think I would like these toys. And I don't have any trucks like that. I'm smiling and saying things like, oh yeah? Is there a cool truck in there? Him saying, yeah. After a while, I hear my husband. Babe, this is crazy. Not entirely sure what he's talking about. I tell him to come closer and show us what he's found. And when he does, he's holding a wooden red truck 
with a pulley rope attached to it. And my son yells, Thank you, Papa. My new truck. We were both amazed. And my husband proceeded to grab a bunch of different toys from the attic. Neither of us knew what to make of that experience. We still really don't. Teetering on, this is kind of cool, this is kind of scary. Fast forward about six months to an event that happened just three nights ago. My husband and I hear our son talking in his room. We can see from under the door that the light is on in his room. We put him to sleep, so we found it curious. Who was he talking to? Possibly childlike chatter before drifting off. But why did he have his light on? We stood outside the door for a moment to try to hear. But we couldn't quite make out what he was saying. Then we heard. Okay, I won't. I promise. My husband stepped back and mouthed to me, let's go in. And as he went to grab the door handle, he pointed to the bottom of the door. Our son's light was now off. We walked in and over to our son's bed. As we did, we both clearly saw the closet door swing open. A door that, per our observation over the last several months, did not do that. If anything, it was hard to open. It worked like the door was too large for the frame or crooked in some way, but not visibly off. I grabbed my husband's hand and he walked over toward the closet. I flipped on the light with my other hand. He let go of my hand, motioning that I grab our son. I walk that way, but keeping my back to my son and my eyes on my husband and the closet. I am jarred by my son suddenly yelling, Papa, he's not in there anymore, but I can't tell you where he is. I promised. My husband searches the closet, I grab our son, and say we're going to sleep in our room. As my husband frantically searches the house, I stay in our room with our son and ask him more about who he was talking to. He tells me that he doesn't know his name, but that he has no face. He used to live here, that this is his house too. He says auntie said not to talk to him, but the man said it's okay, he's a friend. He has toys here, too. He has his own toy chest, and it's downstairs. My son tells me that he's even got another stuffed animal from the toy chest. I keep asking questions, but I can tell that my son has fallen asleep. I wait impatiently for my husband to return. I tell him that we need to go to the basement, as I explain what my son said. But my husband tells me that... He knows about the trunk, in the basement. He didn't recognize the toys, but when our son asked him to grab them, he assumed that I had shown him the toy trunk earlier. I had not. I had actually never seen this trunk. We both decided that we weren't comfortable with our son talking to a man, ghost or real, he wasn't familiar to our family. So we've basically spent the last few days researching the best way to rid your house of these types of spirits. If you suspect it's negative, it's recommended that you rid yourself of things you believe are attached to it. So for us, the first thing we did was get rid of the mystery toy chest and all of the toys that came with it. It's only been a few nights, but since we've implemented a few changes, activity seems to have subsided. Our son hasn't spoken of the man in days. I'm hopeful that the changes we're making to our space help to promote the positive energy in the house. The trunk and the man are a mystery to us, but this home doesn't feel like it's bound to negativity. I just hope I'm right. Early in my career, so over 17 years ago, I worked in a long-term care facility in the dementia unit. In our
our unit, there were around 20 or so residents with dementia on the ground residential level and about 10 patient rooms on the upper level. This is where current residents would go for their scans, exercise, etc. And future residents would stay temporarily before transitioning to an open space on the ground level. Most of the time, it was just me and two other nurses, three nurses working at a time. Now, I'm sure it's well known that people with dementia see things that aren't there. So I won't go into those types of stories, though they are interesting and often sad. Instead, I'm going to talk about a specific room in this unit. For HIPAA reasons, I can't say the name of the facility or the real room number. So we'll call it room six. When I first started, a lot of the older women who worked there, as well as plenty of the male staff, told me that room six was cursed. Initially, I laughed it off, thinking this was some sort of joke. The staff must play this as some sort of initiation for being the new girl. But I'd learn relatively quickly they weren't joking. This was a real theory, if you will, that the facility had, and this was why. Any resident that got placed in room six would die within three weeks, or less. They wouldn't just die, though. They would change entirely, from their personality to things they said, even their physical appearance, all in just the first few days. The staff had seen this happen repeatedly. Doctors and nurses, everyone having no real clue what was going on. And most all of these deaths were a result of cardiac arrest. Something that usually doesn't spring up on a heart-healthy individual. These patients were suffering from dementia. They didn't have pulmonary or cardiac issues. Throughout my time there, I would actually witness this phenomenon. People who lived in that room... I heard the screaming at night. I heard individuals become combative, refuse their medication, and somehow even forget to talk. Not forget words, but literally act as though they couldn't speak. Imagine the Little Mermaid when she's trying to explain that she cannot speak with no voice, no words. Since I didn't have a lot of exposure to these patients before they were residents, I wasn't able to assess fully if this was truly the phenomenon they spoke of or if it was simply a human on the decline due to their illness. However, there was one experience that was enough to send me looking somewhere else for work. There was a patient in the other part of the hospital. Often the patients outside of our dementia unit were confined to hospital-type rooms in the upper level. These rooms were shared with others, so getting a spot in the ground level was sort of a big deal. I had been working with a few patients up there who were waiting for the transition. It was one afternoon after arriving for my shift. I was looking through resident files, updating paperwork, when I saw that there was a new resident form issued for that day. When I glanced over at the paperwork, I see that it's one of the patients I'd been working with upstairs. They've been waiting for a room for quite a while. I was glad for them. This individual was a sweet man. He had his wits about him, with only moments of being non-lucid. The most I would see from this gentleman was that sometimes in mid-conversation, he would just smile and say, thank you, and I hope you have a good day, even if the conversation wasn't over. We would always respond, wishing that he have a good day as well, and these moments were rare. Unlike some patients, I never saw this man angry or afraid. He had a lot of family and support. And aside from his dementia, he was a relatively healthy man. His body was sound and his mind drifting, but he was in good spirits. As I was thinking about how nice it would be to have him on the floor, I instantly got a chill when I saw that he'd be moving to room six. I should have known it was the only room that seemed to ever be available. It's still the fastest turnaround that I've ever seen in my 20 plus years in the field. At the time, I tried to calm myself down, rationalizing that these stories were just that, stories. 
Previous residents passing away could have been the result of underlying illness. And sometimes it's hard to see someone decline. Perhaps the staff was trying to cope with their losses. But I knew this man. He was healthy. He didn't have anything to worry about, and I didn't have anything to worry about, right? That day, I decided I was going to single-handedly give that room a healthy examination, and then request that the cleaning staff give it a final clean as well. Making my way to the room, I remember or realize I've never been inside room six. There'd never been a reason since the previous resident was cared for by a different set of nurses. I'd only been there four weeks at that point, so changing rounds only happened every three months. I immediately noticed that the room was dark, unoccupied, and had clearly already been cleaned very well. I looked around for black mold, poor air filtration. I don't know what I was looking for, but nothing about this room seemed out of the ordinary. It just needed some natural light. So I walked over to open the shades, let some light in, and as I turned back to head out of the room, I saw out of the corner of my eye a person walked quickly past the room entry, like someone was in the hallway. Thinking just that, I waltzed out of the room to grab whatever co-worker it is to see if they knew when the patient from upstairs would officially be moving in. But there was no one there. The hallway was empty. The hairs on the back of my neck were now standing up. I felt a chill and looked back at room six. It still looked like a normal room, but that wasn't normal, I thought. It was now the top of the hour, and I officially needed to make my rounds to three other rooms at the opposite end of the hall. By the end of the day, the experience was forgotten, and I saw that the patient was now a resident, all settled into room six. I went to say goodnight. Delighted, he offered me some tea and cookies. He had a whole little setup of goods. I remember declining the goods, but telling him that it looked like he had quite the housewarming party. That night, as I rode the bus home, I remembered the feeling I had, or vision, that someone had walked past the door in the hallway. I was so distracted by my thoughts, I forgot to pull the lever for my stop. And after a longer walk home than anticipated, I attempted to sleep, but it wasn't easy. I found myself really worried about that room about the resident. I couldn't understand why I was so afraid when I was nowhere near that place now. I had the next day off, so I was happy to be distracted with non-work-related things for a day. But when Friday came and I walked into the place, I instantly felt a bit of fear, and I was eager to know how the resident in room six was doing. Before going to check on the resident, I made sure that he didn't have any visitors or that a nurse wasn't with him. And while looking at the visitor log, one of my co-workers walked into the nurse's neck. She was someone who had originally told me about room six, one of the ones that asked to stop being assigned to that room to no avail. I asked her if she knew if anyone was currently working in room six, if he had visitors, etc. And she gave me a look, like she just remembered something. Almost excited, but more concerned. Has no one told you? My heart sank. I just got here. Told me what? I asked. His family's having him move tonight. I was relieved to hear this, but needed to know more immediately. She explained to me that she isn't sure exactly of the details on the move, because she only heard parts of the conversation. But she knows that the first night he moved in, the night I left, he kept calling for help. Someone would respond and all he could do was cry. But by the middle of the next day, he was screaming. First just screaming in what seemed like agony, but then at people, the staff, his family. It was very emotional, as she put it. And like clockwork, before my coworker could even finish the story, I heard screaming erupting in the hallway. My coworker looking at me, telling me not to go in there unless someone asks me to, to call the nurse assigned to the room. I grab the receiver and page the nurse. Just as I see her rushing down the hallway, my eyes following her. 
and out of the doorway pops a woman who I recognize to be the man's daughter. And directing her words at the nurse, she says, I don't want him sedated. We are moving him soon, but no more meds. He's had enough, and we just need out of this room. The nurse went on to explain the doctor's on his way, that they have an empty room upstairs. The doctor will further examine him. All the while, I hear the screaming, trying so hard not to focus on it and just pay attention to what the nurse is saying. But it's nearly impossible. I feel horrible inside, and I can see that my coworker does as well. But the look on her face is different than mine. I was in shock, and I was sure I resembled someone who looked that way. This was truly unreal to me. I understood this man's condition just as well as most of the people around me. I had spent time with this man, and for that I felt I knew his personality even a bit better than some. He'd never so much as raised his voice. He would never yell at his family or staff. I didn't get to see the man until later that day, as by the time everyone had left his room, I was already working my rounds on the upper level. I decided that I'd visit on my lunch break. When I did finally see him, I could see that he looked exhausted, like he hadn't slept in days. I had just seen him 48 hours ago. He was fine. I sat with him for the duration of my 30 minute lunch break, starting our visit by asking how he was feeling, but he didn't respond. Not verbally anyway. He slowly turned his head to face me fully. His eyes were speaking. He was speaking, but his mouth wasn't moving. He was no longer screaming. Instead, he just simply couldn't speak. Eventually, he'd gotten his lips to move just a bit, but no words to accompany the act. At that time, I reached for his hand, and we sat for just a moment. Before leaving and clocking back in, I asked him if he'd like the TV on, to shake his head yes or no. He stared at me a moment, but he shook his head yes. I flipped through the channels, asking him to squeeze my hand when I landed on something that he'd like. We settled on the National Dog Show. This made me happy. It was right up his alley, and I felt like he was in better shape than when I'd seen him earlier. I made my way to the nurse's nook to figure out where I was headed next, but of course... I caught up with my coworker from earlier. She explained that our resident had only escalated once I left, that the family had requested that he not be sedated, but soon were begging the staff to please sedate him, to please help him. This was all because the screaming turned into the same things described by others. He refused to take his medication, throwing things around the room, Anything near him he was pulling at, including his own IVs. He needed them. He was dehydrated as he'd refused to eat or drink anything all day. When did he stop speaking? I asked. It's hard to say. Definitely not since he was sedated, though. He hasn't screamed or said one word. Just like the others. I told you. That room is cursed. I didn't laugh this time. Instead, I stared down the hallway before going in the opposite direction to care for my residence at that end. At the end of my shift, I made my way to room six, and as I entered the room, it was once again dark, and this time the hairs on my neck stood up instantly, so much so that I could not even bring myself to step in the room. The feeling was overwhelming and I suddenly knew exactly what feeling my coworker was talking about. I knew why she didn't want to work in this room. Through the awful feeling, I observed that the old man had moved. He was no longer in the room. I quickly left the area and found my coworker, asking when he'd moved and if he was okay. Not far, she said. He's actually just upstairs having some tests run by the doctors. He's likely staying up there until his family finds a new facility. I didn't blame them. Most importantly, he's alive, she finished. Yeah, I thought to myself, I'm glad for that. 
Over the next two days, I would see this man literally transform back into himself. I became rather close to his granddaughter and continued to visit him every day. I couldn't believe what I'd seen taken place with this man in front of my eyes. A full transformation, and the only thing I could attach to it was that room. The man himself couldn't recall the experiences, but told me he was much happier not to be in that dark room. The room was well lit when the lights were on or when the windows were open, really only actually dark at night, but I knew what he meant. I continued to work at the facility for the next few months. My next job would be at a dementia care center that said resident was moved to. I remained close with the family and still to this day. And though this man did pass away a few years after this incident took place, I believe that thanks to his family, he lived longer, but also he spent his last years surrounded by love and goodness, not all that silence and darkness. I'll always wonder what exactly that darkness was and how did it grip everyone so tightly. Maybe more importantly, how do you get rid of that sort of thing? Something so dark yet so untouchable. This was about a year ago. I was home from college on spring break. My younger brother was in high school, and he was at school at the time. My parents and my uncle that lived with us were working, so I had the house to myself for a while. I usually just used it to sleep in and not worry about stuff. It was early afternoon, probably noon, when I woke up and started to make breakfast. I was watching some random videos on my phone while eating my scrambled eggs. Eventually, I went to the bathroom, also watching videos on my phone. But I heard something that wasn't coming from my phone. Very clearly, I hear a woman humming a lullaby. Unmistakable sound of humming from just outside my door. It lasted all of five, seven seconds, but by the time I'd turned my phone off, it was still going. A woman's humming outside the door. Not a familiar lullaby, but that tone and feeling. Now, I will say I've always believed in spirits and ghosts and stuff, but I thought logically first. It could have just been the video that I was watching, so I opened it back up, rewound the thing to when I thought I heard the humming, but there was nothing. Even after playing it multiple times, no. The hum didn't come from the video. Then my mind went to, it was probably my mom coming home from work. So I called out for my mom. Nothing. I opened the door and called out again. Still no answer. I sat down on the toilet and I replayed the video a couple of more times. Just to make sure the sound didn't come from there. I decided I wasn't going to take a shower yet. Not until I figured out if somebody was home. When I left the bathroom, the house was silent, just like I'd left it. I walked around the corner, looked out the front, no cars. Checked the garage, no cars. I called my mom and told her what happened. Basically, asking if our house got haunted while I was gone. She also believes in spirits, but said not to worry about it. I mean... I was still sort of worried about it, though. Like, this was for sure something that I could hear. Like, anything else that I could hear. But I wasn't officially, officially spooked until later that day. My uncle got home not too long after this happened. He usually gets home before everybody else because he heads to work around 3 a.m. I didn't really feel like unloading my ghost story on him and had sort of listened to my mom about not worrying about it. After catching up a bit, we went back to watching TV and sat there, 
I was texting some friends about meeting up later that night, when right next to my ear, I hear the humming. I jump up, dash over to the kitchen. I look at my uncle, who must have dozed off in the last two minutes, and then I'm sent jumping again, this time with an actual yelp leaving my mouth. As I see my uncle shoot up and yell, what the hell? And he looks at me, first confused and then, well, I guess still confused, but he says, ah, hell, I'm too tired for this, man. I'll see you later, kid. You're on your own. And retreats back to his room on the other end of the house. I stand there, but only for a moment and decide, no, I'm going to ask him what he heard. I get to his bedroom, open the door, and there's my uncle praying After he lectures me about interrupting his prayer, he tells me that sometimes, in the main room of the house, he hears someone singing, someone humming, maybe even moving dishes around sometimes, fiddling in the pantry. He says half the time he used to think that it was my mom moving around, till he started to put together her schedule, and he'd hear things when she wasn't even home. I stayed in there asking him questions probably a good 30 minutes before... I started to feel bad for keeping him awake. I told him I wasn't done and that we would have more to talk about when he wasn't so tired. When everyone got home that night, I told my brother and my parents what I heard, the conversation with my uncle, and basically at that point, my mom did whatever moms do and took care of the problem. I remember she had someone come bless the house. Plenty of cleanses. Lots of crystals and sage were incorporated into our daily routines over the next week that I was staying home. I would make fun of it all if it didn't actually solve the problem. The problem being an apparent daytime humming house ghost. Who knew? When it comes to my experiences, I've had several friends give me their thoughts or explanations. I've also had a fair number of people relate to me, whether it be they relate to a history of abuse or they relate to the things I've seen or heard. I'll give you some backstory before the stories. When I was a kid, my parents were and still are drug addicts. I believe that my father suffers from undiagnosed mental illness, or even very possibly was possessed growing up. Both of them were abusive people, to each other and sometimes to me. Luckily, I was removed from their care over 13 years ago, and I've lived with a truer family ever since. My mother's brother, my uncle. So... All is well now, but these experiences are from the past, and I want to share them. Aside from being drug addicts, my parents were crazy about a lot of weird stuff. As I've gotten older, my understanding is they were involved in some sort of dark magic or a cult of some kind. I don't know if my parents were legitimate in their practices or if they took place outside of our home as well, but I knew they were into the look of it all. Upside down crosses, shitty makeup, spikes on their clothing. Very cliche, really. They were always at a bar or some concert, coming home usually super late, with some sort of injury from fighting either each other or someone else. The best way to explain them was they often got involved in everything that they shouldn't have. Most of my memories of me were being alone watching TV, or at our neighbor's house. We lived in an RV park, and in the RV directly next to ours was a very nice, very old woman. She wasn't very mobile and couldn't do much in the way of 
taking care of a child, but I enjoyed playing over at her house in her garden, and I think she enjoyed having me around too. Most of the time I would fall asleep at her house, but wake up in my own bed. My bed itself was my safe spot. I always thought that I would be protected if around me I maintained a circle of my favorite stuffed animals and dolls. With every other spot in the house, including the rest of my room, I felt uneasy, especially with my parents' room. One of my first real memories of being scared of something other than my parents themselves involved their room. I was home alone just watching TV and eating macaroni and cheese. I heard something, and at first I thought maybe it was the TV itself. We used bunny ears to get any sort of channel, so sometimes shows and reception would cut out, making that scratchy noise. But as I realized the TV was fine, I heard it again much louder. Scratching, coming from their room. I wasn't allowed in my parents' room. I mean, I'd been in there, but I wasn't supposed to be. And the first time I'd gotten caught, yeah, I got a whooping. So, I was careful to only try if I was sure they were going to be gone for a while, like a concert. Well, this was one of those nights. I turned the TV off and walked over to their room and put my ear up to the door, listening for the scratches I had heard. And after sitting there a while, I instead heard two light knocks on the door. I moved my head back, looked under the door, nothing. I knocked back, got a response. And this went on for a while, back and forth, until I needed to use the restroom. When I came back, I didn't get a response when I knocked. I went to open the door, and I felt the doorknob vibrate. It didn't hurt, but it scared me, so I let go and decided not to go in there. Instead, I went to my room and started creating my stuffed animal fortress. As I lay there drifting off to sleep, I heard the same loud scratching. Now faster. It being dark this time, the scratching was scaring me. I wasn't curious like before. I turned my bedside lamp on, grabbed my doll, and ducked under the covers, until eventually I fell asleep. My next experience is the one that stuck with me most, possibly because I was a bit older, but probably because I saw something. I just celebrated my eighth birthday, and I remember because there was cake, with one of those big number candles on it. It was an eight. I couldn't figure out why my parents weren't leaving the house nearly as often as they usually did. It was obvious for me because I wasn't used to going to bed with them in the house. I'd later find out that my parents were on house arrest. These were the beginning stages of my uncle gaining custody of me. They didn't appear to be doing all of the same drugs I had seen them do before. They were just drinking more, and my father was more destructive than ever at this point. I would hear him screaming from their bedroom, sometimes my mom not even in the room, and he'd still be screaming at something or someone. I could hear crashing coming from the room and would brace myself for when he would come out, being prepared to run to my room. Normally, I'd immediately tuck myself into my safe spot and pretend I was sleeping. I think I believed the stuffed animal fortress would protect me because they never seemed to wake me up for a fight as much as they would pick one with me while awake. So on this specific night, my mom is in the kitchen by the back door smoking a thousand cigarettes, while my dad screams at something in their room. And I'm listening secretly from behind the sofa in the living room. I could hear screaming, and a whole mess was coming from that room. I heard my dad yelling, get the hell out of here, leave me the hell alone, followed by other things that I can't recall. I heard what sounded like someone starting to open the door, so I booked it to my bedroom, leaping into my bed and shutting my eyes. I tried to stop breathing so heavy, thinking my dad was going to be right behind me, but he wasn't. I heard him and my mom talking. They sounded 
Not mad, like scared. I considered moving into my closet or running to our neighbor, but I couldn't move. I just laid there, pretending to be asleep. I heard my parents' voices getting closer, then enter my room. They turn the light on me still pretending to be asleep. But my dad rushes up to me and tries to shake me awake. And even though he doesn't sound mad, I'm terrified anyways and squirm out of his grasp trying to make my way to my closet. My dad screaming as I do, wait, no, no, don't go in there. And for some reason I froze. He runs and grabs me. I'm now in his arms and hear him rambling in my ear. He's repeating something about demons while my mom follows hectically behind. I see that she's crying. Both of my parents are crying, I realize. In that moment, I've never seen them scared. My dad tells my mom to grab the booze and he sits me on the living room sofa. I sit there for what feels like forever. The two of them start to pace back and forth in front of me, asking themselves what they should do. How do they get rid of it? Passing the booze back and forth, not coming up with any answers until it's almost gone. They begin to open all of the doors and windows and start burning some sort of plant, telling me to grab a piece of it, do like they're doing. I'm confused, but I did it, wafting the stinky plant all over the place. It was late, past dark outside. I was tired, and my parents had been at it all day, yelling from every corner of the house for this thing to leave. The next thing I remember is that I'm being moved from the couch to my bed, feeling like it was some sort of dream, but I laid there a moment and it felt nice that they brought me there. I fell asleep. That night, or maybe even early, early morning, before the sun was up, I found myself awake in my dark room. Not sure what woke me up, I turned on the lamp on my bedside table and I gazed towards my closet. And as I did so, the door slowly creaked open not enough to see inside, just a crack. Then, what I can best describe as a very dark black smoke started to creep out of the closet. This black smoke started to form a figure, but the figure didn't start walking. Instead, it began slinking up the wall and onto my ceiling. Now, upside down, right above my head. It was darker than the shadows around it. It was darker than dark itself. And it wasn't going anywhere. Remembering how they cared for me earlier, I began screaming for my parents, but just like old times, they never came. The black smoke figure remained above me, and I remember looking away, closing my eyes, hiding under the covers, crying, begging, for it to just go away. When I thought the coast was clear, I went to slide the covers off my head and realized I was wrong. The figure was no longer above me, it was right next to me. As soon as I realized it, I repeated my earlier steps, closing my eyes, covers over my head, begging, please go away. That's the last memory I have until waking up the next day. I found my parents passed out in the living room. They had made a protective circle of their own. At first, I thought it was sugar that they were sleeping in the middle of, but I saw a canister of salt sitting next to them. Around them in the whole house, I found pages from a Bible. They were spread everywhere. Like I often did on mornings where my parents were incapable. I walked over to the neighbor's house and asked her to use the telephone. She had my uncle's number and dialed it for me. I told him about what had happened, specifically about how everything was broken in the house, and just that I was scared of my room now. I remember him telling me to stay put, and everything else is sort of a blur or a jumbled timeline of when I actually got out of there permanently, but it wasn't long after that. My uncle's house isn't far from where all of this took place, and every time I pass that place, I can't help but wonder if the dark smoke my parents brought into the home still lives there, 
or if it followed my parents instead. I don't talk to them, so I guess I'll never know. And maybe that's the way it should be. Uh, guys, everything's on fire! Everything's on fire! Captain, our shields are down! We're taking damage! What do we do? Initiate commercial break sequence. Neo Retro FM, live from Olympia, Washington. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Modern music programming. NeoRetroFM.com Hi everyone, Amanda Jane here. Taking a moment to talk to you about something my husband Ryan and our band, Forget Me Not, are doing this summer. We're partnering with Foundation ESD and their Nourishing Network program to help families in need all summer. You can help support too. It just takes streaming our music all summer long as we continue to donate 100% proceeds to the foundation. Visit ConductedByForgetMeNot.com for more information and join us in making No Student Hungry a reality. To learn more about the Foundation ESD and their various programs, please visit FoundationESD.org or ConductedByForgetMeNot.com. You saved us, Captain. Now, we can return to the stories in peace. This happened while I was driving around alone at dusk, at the beginning of summer. Basically, I find myself doing this a lot of the time because, you know, COVID. Must entertain myself somehow, or just get out of the house. I live in Blaine, Washington, right on the border of Canada, and about 20 minutes from my house off the highway is a park with some woods. This park stretches across Washington and the Canadian border, but is relatively smaller on our side. Like most drives, I didn't have a specific destination and no intention of getting out of my car. I was about to pass this swampy nature preserve near the park when I felt a pull, not physically, but mentally. I found myself with an extreme need to stop and walk into the woods. Now, to paint a picture of these woods, they're relatively small, but they're also connected to the well-known park and most of its surroundings were the swampy reserve I mentioned. It was relatively foggy from having rained all day, and since it was just past eight, the lighting wasn't ideal. The thing is, in retrospect, I can put together that all of these conditions were not ideal for traveling in the woods alone. But at the time, this pull was stronger than logic. I felt like there was nowhere else I was supposed to be. In the forest, there's this one trail that takes you back underneath a fallen tree to a small pond, separate from the overall swamp and park area. I walked the trail and stood there for several moments, admiring the eerily beautiful scene of fog resting on top of the water, when I suddenly got the feeling I wasn't alone. It wasn't so much a dark feeling as it was my ears reacting to others around me. Like if you had your eyes closed, but you could still feel that someone entered the room. I turned, and sitting on top of the fallen tree trunk I had just walked under, was a strange something. Almost crouching to make itself even smaller, and watching me. I would guess that it was no more than two feet tall. It appeared to be made up of skin and bones, with a small but humanoid body. But the face was deformed somehow. I could explain it differently, almost gremlin-like, less humanoid than its body. I don't recall a nose, just that where its eyes should be it was an empty, shiny, black hole. Its skin looked like leather, but was whitish and gray in color. In a way, it was hard to look at, hard to focus on. It was and still is difficult to recall exactly what the details were. The figure was so small, and it seemed at least partially transparent. I found myself ducking behind a large bush next to me, slowly and quietly, observing to see if the creature's head moved as I did. But the head didn't follow me. It was still staring where I once stood. 
I moved my head and adjusted myself in hopes that maybe I could observe a little bit longer. But when I peeked my head back, it was gone. At first I was disappointed, but then the same pull that seemed to bring me out here in the first place was urging me to not just go back to my car, but to run. Even though I'm not a runner whatsoever and despise most unnecessary physical activity, this was necessary. Everything inside of me was telling me that, and so without much thought at all, I was sprinting back to my car. I mean, one moment I was frozen, and the next moment, my feet are moving faster than I've ever seen them move before. I was at my car in what felt like seconds. Once inside, I started the ignition and looked around, seeing nothing but fog surrounding me. It was much thicker now. I looked down and I realized I was wearing my sandals, which were completely destroyed, covered in mud and whatever else. This was the first time I started to question my decision to go into the woods. I could still remember the pulling feeling I had. I was drawn there. But in that moment in the car, catching my breath, my mind was clearer in that I should get out of there. After getting back home and taking a shower, I called my best friend just to talk about what I saw. Honestly, she was more concerned that I went into the woods by myself. I didn't feel like she understood what I was talking about, meaning I didn't feel like I made that choice. I understood the worry, but it didn't help that she just thought I was not in my right mind. She told me it was probably an owl, but owls don't have arms, I argued, which I still maintain. I guess I've decided that it doesn't matter if anyone believes me or knows what I'm talking about. This was for sure a real event that accounts for at least 30 minutes of my life. If someone out there has any idea of what it could have been, I do want to know. I used to hang out there all the time, at least the park, but I haven't returned since. These are some of my recent experiences, ones that I'm not able to rationally explain. Once the pandemic started, my job suddenly became a lot different. I used to work in a large office building downtown, working IT for a company I won't name. I still work for the company, but my entire setup has been moved to my home. And since I'm a manager who oversees various engineers, my setup is quite heavy duty. So much so that I've actually seen my electric bill rise almost $100 a month since moving home. This is not a complaint. Or I should say my complaint is not about my job. I'm extremely grateful to have a job right now. I just really wish I wasn't getting the sense that my new office is occupied. I've lived in my house for over two years. It's a rental and the owner lives out of state, so it's rare that I see the man. Up until about three, four months ago, I was quite enjoying myself in the house. The first occurrence happened when I was alone in my room, laying on my bed and scrolling through my phone. In that moment, my lamp, which was on the desk at the other end of my room, flickered on and stayed on. Even though the sun was out, my curtains were closed, so the sudden flicker of light immediately grabbed my attention, but also the sound. It sounded as though it had been switched on. It was one of those lamps where, on the shade, there's a little black button, I guess, and you have to push it to make the light go on or off. I walked over, I looked under the lampshade, it was switched on. So I turned the lamp off, making sure the little switch was clicked all the way over and shook it a little bit, and then I left it alone. I would think nothing of it if it didn't happen repeatedly since. This actually happened the day before yesterday, and I guess gave me a little extra push to write some things down. It also made me think maybe I should get rid of the lamp. The next weird thing that also seems to repeat itself is the office room light. Since taking on more equipment, I've been very conscious of my energy intake, and I'm sure to turn everything off that doesn't need to be on. 
This would obviously include any lights in rooms that I'm not using. I'd finished working for the night. I shut almost everything down and was sure to turn off the light. The office room has a chandelier type of light where the fixture is not on the ceiling but rather dangles from it. So yes, I shut everything off, locked the office door, company policy, and went to the kitchen to start making something for dinner. I turn the TV on to play some music while I cook. Usually I eat in the living room because I watch TV while I eat, which I think is pretty normal. I have a table, but it's mainly there for when I have company. So I look for the remote as I head to the couch, but I don't see it in its normal spot. And I can't find it anywhere. Seems like something most people deal with, but I had just had the thing in my hand before starting dinner and always put it in the same spot. The place is not very large, and I'm a pretty minimalist kind of guy. I don't have stuff everywhere or anything like that. There were only so many things I could look under. As I'm crouched on the ground looking under the couch, my eyes are drawn to the office, where I can see that the office light is on. I felt nervous. I knew I turned that off. I walked over there, and the door was still locked, so I grabbed my keys and unlocked it. When I did, there was the remote on the corner of my desk and the hanging light above me moving ever so gently back and forth. Now, the same kind of thing happened with my phone, but I wasn't as sure of my exact order of operations. So since then, I'm trying to be more diligent about where I put basically anything. I have a routine so that if something goes missing or temporarily misplaced, I know for a fact it wasn't me. I don't know how this helps me, but if I can incorporate some sort of surveillance, I'm confident that I'll find something. The last story that I'll share has to do with lights as well, but the bathroom. This bathroom is one of those where the light switch is on the outside. Never understood this type of setup, but growing up in our basement bathroom, it was the same way. My brother and I would mess with each other constantly and turn the light off on the other one that was in there, incapacitated. But in my current case, it didn't matter. I lived alone and didn't have to worry about that. Until I did. This happened roughly three weeks ago, and it really rubbed me the wrong way, so I did end up venting to the owner afterwards. I was taking a shower, and it was roughly 8 p.m., so it wasn't pitch black outside, but it was dusk. One moment, I'm washing my hair. Clearly, the bathroom light is on. Close my eyes to rinse out my hair. Open my eyes, and it's dark. Only the small bit of light peeking through the tiny bathroom window. Damn, I think. I was more frustrated about finishing my shower in the dark than anything. I thought I had just burned out. But when I got out of the bathroom and walked to go to my room, I saw the switch on the outside was turned off. So I flipped it, and boom, lights were on. Somehow, the light had been turned off in the middle of my shower while living alone. Yeah, there's something about the lights and this house, but it's not bad wiring. So far, I haven't been able to chalk it up to anything. I just know that the owner had an electrician come out here twice. Once before I actually moved everything from the downtown office to the house, and once just a couple of weeks ago when I finally told the owner about how often these lights were turning themselves on or off. And even if it was bad wiring, how do you explain the remote or phone incidents? or hard switches being turned on and off. Things that you have to touch, but I'm not touching. Well, everyone, we've reached the end of the hour. So thank you for being a part of tonight's episode. And if you're not too scared, Join me right here every Friday night at 11 p.m. Only on NeoRetroFM.com. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me. Amanda, Darkest Hour, 
at gmail.com or on Reddit, Amanda Jane FMN. Stay spooky.